Well, it was turnaround Tuesday in the global financial markets uh, as stocks are recovering from two days of carnage following the surprise Brexit vote in the UK. The Dow is up almost 270 points today. NASDAQ up about 97. But really, the markets got beaten up the last couple of days. The smallest bounce actually was from the banks, which have been beaten up the most. So they had the biggest drop. And they had the smallest bounce, which really shows you how weak that sector is. The fact that it couldn't even manage much of a dead cat bounce. In fact, the carnage in the banks, particularly the European banks, is much bigger than it was during the the financial crisis of 08. In the aftermath of uh, Bear Stearns and then Lehman Brothers, uh, when everything was imploding, this is even worse than it was back then, which really shows you how much more levered up the banking system must be thanks to all these years of uh, QE and negative interest rates. And of course, how much farther behind can the American banks be uh, from their European cousins? I mean, they're all so interconnected and interdependent. And U.S. bank stocks, too, were hitting uh, you know, 52-week lows yesterday. And again, the bounce was quite muted on this side of the pond as well. So I still think that there's a lot of carnage coming. In fact, some of these banks may uh, be in a position where they have to raise equity, which means they have to sell stock. And clearly the market is not going to like that. But again, you know, everybody is really blaming this on all the uncertainty surrounding Brexit. And I hear all these stories about how so many companies are gonna be affected uh, by this. And, you know, to me, the whole thing really seems like a bunch of nonsense. If we had a healthy financial system, if the markets were sound and prices were based on fundamentals, would it really make that much of a difference if the UK were in the EU or not? I mean, what do they got, 28 members of the EU? I mean, so if it's got 27 members, is that really a big deal? I mean, how many countries are not part of the EU? I mean, so if Britain decides to join the countries that are not in the EU, as opposed to one of the 28 that's there, I mean, yes, it is one of the biggest countries. I think it might be about 10% of the population, which is significant, but you know that means 90% of the population is still gonna be there. Does anybody really believe that Europe is gonna isolate itself from the UK or vice versa? I don't think that's in anybody's interest. Uh, but what is being revealed here is the fragility of this whole system that's being propped up artificially by the banks, by cheap money, by negative interest rates. And everybody is speculating and everybody is uh, assuming that the powers that be, whether it's the political powers, the government, you know, the, the Congress or in Europe, Parliament or whatever it is, and certainly the central banks, they've got everything under control. They've got everything covered. You know, it's a big put out there. Nothing can go wrong. And then when something does go wrong, then people get nervous and they wake up and say, wait a minute, maybe it's not as safe as we thought. Maybe they don't have this thing under control. Maybe something can go wrong. Maybe Murphy was right, right? And, uh, and so this is what's happening. And it really exposes the vulnerability of the system, the fragility of it, uh, how it's all hype and, and, and hope and, and confidence. And this Brexit vote is shaking investor confidence. And it should be, because there should be a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people talking now. Jimmy Rogers was out. I saw an interview with him. This is going to be worse than the uh, the 08 crisis. Alan Greenspan again is out there talking about why this potentially could be worse. And what's worse is not the Brexit. It's that is Brexit the, the match that finally lit this tinderbox. The tinderbox has been there all along. In fact, it's been getting bigger and bigger. There's been more kindling, more wood put in that tinderbox uh, with all this new debt. And something is the match that's going to light it, right? And maybe it's this. Now, maybe it's not. Maybe it'll be something else that's going to happen. But this sure looks suspiciously like it could be it, given what we're seeing in the markets. It certainly, as I said before, gives the Federal Reserve the excuse that it's been looking for all year uh, as far as how do we, you know, 
stop the rate hikes without acknowledging how weak the economy is, well, we got Brexit. It's the gift that's going to keep on giving as they're going to be negotiating this thing for years. And now, in fact, I'm looking at the markets. And according to the bond markets, the market is pricing in right now. They're pricing in a greater likelihood of a rate cut than a rate hike. This is the first time that's been the case in several years. And, you know, I've been saying that all along. If you go back to the hike in December of last year, what did I say immediately after that rate hike? I said at the time that I thought the next move by the Fed was more likely to be a cut back to zero than another hike. And of course, back then, nobody but me was saying that. And people are like, oh, Peter Schiff, you're crazy. Well, now here we are uh, six months later. And now the odds are greater that the Fed's next move is a cut. So I wasn't uh, so crazy after all. But my thinking is it was always the case. The odds were greater in December of a cut than a hike. It's just that nobody knew it. Nobody was talking about it. But I think the Fed all along knew that they weren't going to hike. I mean, that's why they waited until December to hike last time. And when they saw the January carnage, they got the message loud and clear. You know, again, if that was a trial balloon, it was the Hindenburg. And, and so they've been looking for a face-saving excuse. And see, the difference is the markets didn't realize this. The markets still believed all the hype. They still thought the Fed was going to raise rates. They still believed in this phony recovery. But now that you've got what's going on in the financial markets, now people are starting to think, okay, the Fed's not going to hike. You know, and again, I pointed out based on Janet Yellen's uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony when she said, oh, the Fed's not concerned about the markets. Well, <laughs> if you didn't believe they were concerned about the markets, why would you assume that they're uh, going to take the hikes off the table? Because it's market noise. I mean, there's no uh, noticeable effect yet on the U.S. economy. Now, the U.S. economy is weak anyway. And everybody's been ignoring it. So maybe what the Fed is going to do is scapegoat the problems in Europe and say, oh, the U.S. economy is weak now. Oh, because of Europe, because of Brexit. I mean, what's the big deal? You know, what would be a big deal, I guess, if a state left uh, the United States, because maybe, you know, California is a little over 10 percent of the population. So maybe California is, uh, you know, like like the U.K. is to the to EU. What would happen if California left the United States? First of all, I think that'd be great if California left because, you know, they take all their uh, Democratic uh, voters along with them. Um, but, you know, what would happen in the event of a U.S. state seceding? That would be a major, major blow to the global financial markets because people would start to worry about U.S. treasuries. Now, they should be worrying about them anyway. But what would happen if a, a state left, because the EU doesn't have all this debt that uh, the member nation states are responsible for. But if a big chunk of the U.S. population left the United States, and I'm assuming if a state could secede, then all the people in that state would, would no longer be U.S. citizens, although maybe they would be. Maybe the U.S. government would still claim that they're citizens, because after all, if you're born in America, you're a citizen, unless you renounce your citizenship. And the U.S. government would probably make it very expensive for any citizens of a seceding state to renounce that citizenship, because they want to tax them. Because, you know, if, if a state were to leave the United States, what would happen to its obligations to repay the national debt. You know, they were talking about that when Scotland was talking about leaving the UK because the UK has a national debt. And they were like, well, Scotland, if you're going to go, you know, you're going to have to take your share of the national debt. But the point is, even, even if Scotland had agreed to accept its share of the British debt, it could just default once it agrees. I mean, because you can't do anything. I mean, if you're a sovereign nation, you default on your debt. There's really nothing your creditors could do. I mean, they could refuse to loan you money in the future, but they can't sue you. They can't do anything. You know, so even if a state left the United States and agreed, okay, yeah, we'll take our share of the national debt, they just default. So look, we're not going to pay these obligations. We didn't run them up. This was from a prior regime. It's a different country. But that's what would really be a big thing because everybody around the world, of course, is holding U.S. paper. And so they would be worried about it. But Britain leaving the UK, I mean, people don't own EU debt. I mean, and, and Britain isn't even in the euro currency. I mean, they still have their own currency, the pound, which, as I said, has been getting pounded 
uh, pretty brutally the last few days. It was up slightly today, uh, but nothing compared to how much it was down uh, the previous the previous two days. But as I said from the beginning, if we had a healthy economy, all right, so Britain's going to leave the EU. It really wouldn't be that big a deal. If we had a healthy banking sector, the banks would have no problem. The fact is that it's all propped up with central bank cheap money. The banking system is completely insolvent. It is just a, you know, a tinderbox in search of a match. And here, here comes one, and it's all, it's all going up. But instead of actually talking about what Brexit is exposing, most of the mainstream financial papers or the, the, the television networks, I mean, they're just acting as if this is really what, what the problem is, as if there isn't a bigger underlying issue that is being laid bare by the market reaction to what would normally not be that big a deal uh, in, in the normal scheme of things. And of course, we don't even know for sure if Britain is actually going to follow through because it's like a two-year process or something for them to leave and a lot can happen in two years. I mean, I read this article in the Financial Times. A guy made a lot of good points that, you know, maybe the EU is going to make some concessions to the Britain and say, okay, well, maybe we'll let you fish a little bit more in some of your waters and maybe we'll, you know, give you a little bit more control of your border. And I don't know what, they might make a few concessions and then, hey, let's have another vote, right? I mean, it's, you know, 52 to 48, doesn't take that much uh, to push the vote in the other direction. So who knows if they're even leaving? But, you know, I tell you, I'd be, it'd be hard-pressed for them to sign up any new members. I mean, think about this, right? I mean, why would you join the EU? I mean, if you weren't in the EU now, why the hell would you join? Because, A, look at how difficult it is theoretically to leave, right? I mean, it's, a, it's all this chaos. So if it's so hard to leave... Why would you join? I mean, you see that all over Europe anyway when it comes to labor laws, right? They, they make it very difficult to fire anybody in Europe. And, and so the harder it is to fire somebody, the less likely you are to take a chance on hiring them in the first place. So that's the same thing in, uh, in the EU. I mean, if it's really this hard to leave, why even join? And, of course, a long time ago, you could make a viable case why joining was a good thing. Right now, given how badly the British won out, how, I mean, talk about a PR problem. If they really want new members, how are they going to get new members? I mean, so, I mean, if Britain is going to leave, obviously it's not going to be the first one. There's going to be more countries that are going to leave, which is probably another reason why the EU may try to do something to keep keep Britain in or, you know, maybe give them like a, a junior membership or some other kind of, you know, keep them in the club, but, you know, get, you know let them off the hook on a few things or I, I don't know what. But there's, a, there's certainly a lot at stake. For, for the for the bureaucrats, because they, again, this is an experiment in big government, and we don't even need to experiment in big government because we already know that it's going to fail. See, that's the problem, right? The definition of insanity. Politicians want to experiment over and over again, right? They keep thinking that they can make big government work. If we just have different people running it, smarter people than all the people who have tried in the past, that somehow they're going to they're going to make it work. But this is an experiment that doesn't need to be repeated. Because it's already been repeated over and over again all throughout history. You know, it's one of the things I think I've talked about it before. You know, collectively, normally, over time, society builds upon, you know, what, what, it's, what it's learned. I mean, technology continues to grow, right? We don't forget all the technology that was invented 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, right? We, 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 we retain that knowledge and we build on it. The same thing with a medicine or all sorts of human endeavors, uh, you know, architecture, you know, we don't forget what our grandparents learned. We, we, we just take what they learned and we build on it. So we don't have to start from scratch all over again. The one exception is, is economics or politics. We never learn from the mistakes of our ancestors. It's, it's, it's as if we're starting all over again and there's no history book. And can you imagine doing that in any other discipline? If you had a, we had to start math, every generation had to start from scratch. Like they didn't remember any of the theorems or any of the, anything that happened before it or in any scientific discipline. I mean, we, we, you know, we'd still be in the caves, right? We wouldn't have anywhere if we couldn't build on what people before us learned. If we didn't learn from their mistakes, 
uh, you know, all we would just do is repeat them. But that's exactly what happens. Every generation or so, we start fresh, and it's like, hey, why don't we try socialism? I mean, will this work? As if we don't have all these historical examples where it's failed, everybody, just start all over again. Like, we don't know. You know, I mean, how can we not know by now that capitalism is what works, that freedom is what works, that none of this stuff works because it's been failing for thousands of years and it's probably going to fail for thousands more even in the future no matter how advanced we get maybe we'll all be you know you know transported around like in star trek and we'll be flying out in space and there'll be some idiot in some space colony that decides he wants to try socialism you know and you know in fact even if you if you look at some of these star trek episodes you look at some of the politics they're acting as if they're living in some kind of socialist utopia and it actually works because that's what people think that they think that eventually we'll evolve beyond profits. We'll be, be yeah, we'll, everybody will just, you know, be, be doing everything from each according to his ability to each according to his need. If we could just become advanced enough, then this whole Marxist socialist utopia is going to work. Well, you know what? We're a lot more advanced than we were when Marx came up with his ideas. We certainly have a lot more technology. If they don't work any better now than when he first thought it up. And of course, it's just a rehash of ideas that have been in place for a long time and they have never worked. I mean, I tell that story all the time um, around Thanksgiving, you know, the, the pilgrims uh, came here, you know, from Europe when they first came here, the first colony, they all tried socialism, right? It was like everybody, hey, let's all collectively farm uh, from each according to his ability, right? We will each work as hard as we can and then we'll each take what we need, right? And everybody almost starved to death. I mean, it was almost a complete disaster. And it wasn't until it was like, okay, forget this, every man for himself, that they were able to feed themselves. Because then once people knew that, okay, I'm going to grow the food and I get to eat it, right? It's not, you know, then people grow food. But before that, it was like, well, I'll let the other guy do it. I mean, why should I work when someone else is going to eat my food? I'll just relax and let somebody else do the work, right? That's what everybody thought. And so nobody worked and everybody starved. But once it was every man for himself, then everybody worked, and, they, and there was plenty of food. They had more food than they knew what to do with. They could trade some to the Indians, right? They can finally have a Thanksgiving feast because they had they had abandoned uh, socialism and they embraced the capitalism. You think that you know that's enough, right? Shouldn't we know enough from that one experiment? No, of course we have to keep doing it over and over and over again. Hey, let me get to some of the economic news that has come out the last couple of days. Of course, it's pretty much bad, uh, but. Again, with all of the turmoil going on in the markets, no one's really talking about uh, the U.S. economic data. Now, eventually, all this bad economic data is going to take its toll once we get all this noise out of the Forex markets. Because right now, the dollar has been strengthening, although it or weakened today, but it strengthened the last couple of days. Everybody, again, is talking about this is flight to quality, flight to safety. No, it's not. I mean, do those people really think Japan is the safe haven? I mean, come on. I mean, the, the yen is stronger than the dollar, and everybody will agree that Japan is a mess. So it's not about safety. It's just about unwinding the carry trades and buying back the funding currencies. And, of course, that is the reason the dollar is going up. If anybody is reading any more into this as if, oh, this is really good news for the dollar, it's not. It's just short-term good for the dollar because of the unwinding of these trades. But once this stuff plays out, the fundamentals are going to take over. And now people are going to start to notice that the markets are pricing in a better chance of a rate cut than a rate hike. And in fact, if the Fed cuts rates, it's not going to be like a one-time deal. I mean, it's going to be the beginning of the next easing cycle, which could be even bigger than the last one. And obviously, they can't have as many rate cuts because they're basically barely above zero. So it means the only thing the Fed could do if it wants to stay out of negative rates, which it will probably want to resist for a while, is just massive quantitative easing. See, before they did quantitative easing before, they had a lot of rate cuts. They went down from 5% to zero. So they used up all that ammo, and then they took out the, the bazookas of QE. But next time around, they're going to have to go straight to QE. And obviously, it's going to have to be much bigger than the last rounds because they're going to have to use it as their first line of defense. It's not like they're calling in the cavalry for reinforcements. This is all we got. And so when people realize that, this is very, very negative for the dollar. I think the dollar is going to fall through the floor. The, the entire rally is going to be reversed because it never should have happened. It was based on false assumptions, but not just reversing the rally. 
uh, we're going to lose a lot more than where the dollar was when it started the rally. It's not just going to surrender its gains. It's going to have some real significant losses, and those losses are coming. But we got the uh, trade deficit in goods for the month of May, which ended up being slightly bigger than what had been anticipated, and that will knock a little from the second quarter GDP. In fact, I'm expecting uh, the uh, Atlanta Fed, I think they're going to take their number. They're, do, they're revising numbers again, I think, tomorrow or the next day. I bet they're going to come down from their 2.6 where they are now. I think they're going to come down from there. Uh, and they're prob probably going to have to go a lot lower, you know, b between now and the actual number. But I think they're going to revise it down. But also, exports uh, were down and imports were up. That's not a good thing, uh, you know, because that just widens your trade deficit and it just shows you're, you know, you're, you're borrowing more money. You want to, ex you want your exports to be up and your imports to be down. So we're we're doing it backwards. We also got the PMI uh, flash service index that came out uh, for June and it was almost as bad as the prior month. Prior month was fifty one point two and we barely improved. We got fifty one point three, which is still a pretty weak number. Dallas Fed manufacturing also continues to be in the negative. I mean, last month, this month, or the June, rather, was not as bad as uh, May, uh, but we're still negative 7 on the production index and negative 18.3 on the general activities. That's not much better than the negative 20.8 from the, the prior month. So these are some bad numbers. We got the Richmond Fed manufacturing number was minus 7. This is the lowest it's been in, I don't know, two or three years. Uh, you know, it, 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 well off the the level from uh, from the prior month, and we did get a GDP number. We got the final revision to the fourth quarter GDP, and so the initial estimate number we got 0.5, and then they ratcheted that up to 0.8, and the consensus was it would go up to one, and we got 1.1. So we actually got a higher number than the consensus. But the main reason that that happened was because of the reduction in the deflator. See, they're trying to report real GDP, not nominal, just the real number, which is supposed to adjust it for inflation. And so last time we got the numbers, the government said the inflation rate was six tenths of one percent on an annualized basis, not for the quarter, for the whole year, which I didn't believe that number when I saw it. But now they went down to 0.4 for the year. That means 0.1 for the quarter. So the government is, wants us to believe that inflation in the first quarter of this year, and you saw how much prices were going up. I mean, it, you know, prices were really moving up in the first quarter. Rents, medical bills, uh, gas prices went way up in the first quarter. But according to the government, the annualized rate of inflation for the first quarter is 0 0.4, 0 0.4. That's why... They can get 1.1. And, of course, they round all this up because, actually, I looked at the nominal GDP number, and it's 1.4. That's the nominal growth of the U.S. economy, 1.4. Now, according to the government, inflation was so low that, you know, the real growth is still 1.1. But what if inflation is not four-tenths of 1%? What if it's 1.5% on an annualized basis, which would still be really low? I mean, it's still lower than the 2%, right, that the Fed— claims is its goal. But what if inflation is 1.5%? Well, then the economy contracted. What if it's 2%? Well, then it contracted even more. Now, 2% to me seems more believable than 0.4. But somehow the government comes up with 0.4 and it manufactures growth out of thin air. Now, again, I still think that we're probably in recession this quarter. I mean, again, I if we had a real inflation number, then you know it would be obvious. But we'll see. Because I've said this before, when the government goes back and calls a recession, they don't do it in real time, right? They, they, you know, they are the Monday morning quarterbacks when it comes to recession. They're not doing anything on game day. So let's say we're in a recession right now. By the time the government admits it, it'll be many, many months from now, maybe later in the year or maybe even early next year. And then they'll go back and they'll revise down all the numbers from prior quarters and they'll show us when the recession began. That's how, I mean, that's pretty much how they do it all the time. So you never actually know officially that you're in the recession until you're deep in it. In fact, in many cases, it's almost over by the time you know. 
The, the difference is this recession is likely to last so long and be so deep that that ain't going to happen, right? We'll still be in the thick of it uh, when they go around and, and, and revise the numbers and, and, and admit. But, of course, they're hoping that by the time they do that, the election is already over and Hillary Clinton is in the White House, right, before they have to go back and say, oh, by the way, uh, the Obama recovery wasn't real. In fact, we were in a recession for most of the last year of it, or theoretically, uh, and you know people won't have a chance to uh, to take their votes back. So this is this is the name of the game right now is try to ex ex extend and pretend this thing through the uh, the elections because that is the other potential fear factor coming in with the Brexit vote is you know everybody was surprised at how the British voted, and I wasn't surprised. I mean obviously going into it, the polls seemed to indicate and the betting seemed to indicate that they were going to lose. But the fact that they won didn't surprise me. I mean, given how bad things are, I mean, I, you know, you, you see how the U European Union is screwing things up and what's going on over there, especially with the ECB and these crazy negative rates and the things that they're doing. You would think there'd be a lot of reasons that, that people would want out. Um, and so they surprised the pollsters. Well, people are going to start to worry about a similar surprise over here. And again, what would be the big surprise that would shock everybody, and that would be Trump, Trump becoming president. Nobody, nobody wants that in the political establishment. I mean, see, that's why a lot of the Republicans would rather see Hillary Clinton be president, because at least she's on the team, right? Because all Demopublicans, they're all in this together, you know, and, and it's just a big game, and they want to keep everybody in this club, right? Just like they don't want the third parties. They don't want, you know, the libertarians getting in there. I mean, think about this. I mean, you know, why isn't the media. I mean, you got so many people that say they don't like either candidate. This is probably the most that people have said that. I mean, it's normally true, right? Normally, people don't like either candidate, and you hold your nose and you vote for the lesser of the two evils. But this time, right, it, you know, it's it's even bigger than normal. Where I, you know, I mentioned before, you got almost half of the Bernie Sanders supporters don't want to vote for Hillary Clinton, and and so they want they want a a, a, a choice. And a good chunk of them are saying, look, I'll vote for Trump over over. I mean, they're going to go from Sanders to Trump rather than Sanders to Hillary. Now, there are a number that are going to uh, Gary Johnson, who, of course, ideologically is the best candidate in the race, uh, certainly the closest to to my, you know, my perspective. But, you know, I don't know if uh, Sanders voters are saying they'd vote for Johnson because they actually know anything about him or just because he's not Trump. And, and, and a pollster asked them, well, would you vote for, uh, you know, Trump, uh, Gary Johnson or Hillary Clinton? They said, oh, I'll just Gary Johnson, because he's not Clinton and he's not Trump, right? They don't even care who he is. He's almost like the none of the above candidate. But none of the above, I mean, I mean, I mean, mean, that'd be a great name to have. I mean, if you can get on the ballot as none of the above in this presidential election, you know, you're going to win. Right. I mean, if, if, if somebody could change their name to that. But this would be a time where you would think that the media would be all over at Gary Johnson, especially for the Republicans, because Gary Johnson is a two term ex Republican governor. And the VP on the libertarian ticket is also a former Republican governor from from Massachusetts. So you got two Republicans, ex governors running on the ballot in all 50 states. And you've got all these Republicans saying, hey, we need an alternative. We need a third party. No, you don't. You got one. Libertarians. What, where, you know, where is the, the, the discussion here? Because, again, as much as they don't like Trump, they don't want to break up that duopoly. They want to keep this thing as either Democrat or Republican, and you don't have a, you don't have a third choice. Right? Because the presidential debates, as much as Gary Johnson says he wants to be in those debates, he can't be in the debates. Because according to the debates, you got to have 15% of the polls. Okay, great. Well, how do you get 15% of the polls if you're not even in the polls? I mean, they're in the polls in a roundabout way, but they're not really in the polls. And believe me, the last thing they want is, is Gary Johnson uh, in, in the, the, the presidential debates. Now, of course, you well, if you look at Gary Johnson, what about Jill Stein? I mean, Jill Stein runs – I mean, she's always a candidate uh, for the Green Party, although I guess Gary Johnson was a Republican a Libertarian part, candidate last year as well. But if you let Gary in, well, do you have to let the Greens in? I mean, the Greens will not be on the ballot in all 50 states. They usually aren't. They'll, they'll be on, she'll probably be on in, in, in enough to theoretically win if she won every state where she was on the ballot. But hell, yeah, put her in there. You know, why not put, uh, put the Green Party? Put I have all four of them up there. Uh, but they won't do that.
it'll boil down to to Trump and and Hillary. But the the establishment, the powers that be, are very afraid of Trump because they he's a loose cannon. He's an unknown quantity. You don't know. I mean, I've said this many times. I mean, and that's why you know, if if I had my choice between Trump and Clinton, and that was my only choice, I would pick Trump. And people say, well, you know, why? Why do you support Trump? Well, with Hillary, I know exactly what I'm going to get. A disaster. I know she's going to be an awful president. So, you know, she's a devil I know. Now, the devil I don't know may not be a devil at all. I don't know. I don't know about Trump. As I said, a lot of things that he says I disagree with, but I don't know if he agrees with the things himself that he's saying. He could just be saying what he needs to say to become a politician. Now the question is, okay, well, then he's a liar. Well, you know, I mean, maybe these are white lies that he's telling for a reason because he has a, a bigger purpose. He knows that if he tells the truth, he won't be able to be president. So he says what all politicians do. And then once he gets into office, he can do something different. And so maybe he's doing that. Or maybe he actually believes what he's saying. I don't know. Now, there are a number of things that Trump says that I do agree with. So my point is, Trump's an unknown quantity. He could be an awful president or he could be a great president. With Hillary Clinton, we know she's going to be an awful president. So at least, you know, roll the dice, take a chance. But, you know, that upsets the apple cart. Just like... Britain deciding they want to leave the EU upsets that apple cart. So I think more and more people are going to start to think about that. And there's a lot of other problems that are going to start to, uh, you know, rise here that are going to start to overshadow what's going on in, in, in the UK or in Europe. And I think the second half of this year could end up being a much more interesting year and a much weaker year for the U.S. dollar, which started to go down, uh, got a bit of a reprieve over the last couple of days on the unwinding of these carry trades. But again, the economic news keeps coming out bad. The rate hike scenario is gone. That whole story, you know, it, it, it's turned around completely, you know, as if it was ever going to happen. Well, now people realize that it's not. So this is really a game changer. And the fact that gold is strengthened uh, and the fact that it's broken out is a very telling thing. The fact that so few people have bothered to notice it or so few of the professional investors are participating in the trade. To me, this is going to be a big move. It's still coming. What happened that one day we got that 100-point day, right? Goals up $100 in a day on the Brexit vote day. Look, that's the first time I've seen that happen, but it ain't going to be the last. And I think we're going to see one day gold will be up over 100 bucks, and it'll close over $100. And it's going to be with the dollar going down. I mean, gold went up a lot in an environment where the dollar was strong. But that's not where gold really shines. It shines brightest with a weak dollar. And the weak dollar environment, that is exactly where we're headed. Decides to join the countries that are not in the EU as opposed to one of the 28 that's there. I mean, yes, it is one of the biggest countries. I think it might be about 10% of the population, which is significant. But, you know, that means 90% of the population is still going to be there. Does anybody really believe that Europe is going to isolate itself from the UK or vice versa? I don't think that's in anybody's interest. Uh, but what is being revealed here is the fragility of this whole system that's being propped up artificially by the banks, by cheap money, by negative interest rates. And everybody is speculating and everybody is uh, assuming that the powers that be, whether it's the political powers, the govern, you know, the the Congress or in Europe Parliament or whatever it is, and certainly the central banks, they've got everything under control. Well, it was turnaround Tuesday in the global financial markets uh, as stocks are recovering from two days of carnage following the surprise Brexit vote in the UK. The Dow is up almost 270 points today. NASDAQ up about 97. But really, the markets got beaten up the last couple of days. The smallest bounce actually was from the banks, which have been beaten up the most. So they had the biggest drop. And they had the smallest bounce, which really shows you how weak that sector is, the fact that it couldn't even manage much of a dead cat bounce. In fact, the carnage in the banks, particularly the European banks, is much bigger than it was 
during the the financial crisis of 08, in the aftermath of uh, Bear Stearns and then Lehman Brothers, uh, when everything was imploding, this is even worse than it was back then, which really shows you how much more levered up the banking system must be thanks to all these years of uh, QE and negative interest rates. And, of course, how much farther behind can the American banks be uh, from their European cousins? I mean, they're all so interconnected and interdependent. And U.S. bank stocks, too, were hitting, uh, you know, 52-week lows yesterday. And, again, the bounce was quite muted on this side of the pond as well. So I still think that there's a lot of carnage. They've got everything covered. You know, it's a big put out there. Nothing can go wrong. And then when something does go wrong, then people get nervous and they wake up and say, wait a minute, maybe it's not as safe as we thought. Maybe they don't have this thing under control. Maybe something can go wrong. Maybe Murphy was right. right? And, uh, and so this is what's happening. And it really exposes the vulnerability of the system, the fragility of it, uh, how it's all hype and, and, and hope and, and confidence. And this Brexit vote is shaking investor confidence. And it should be, because there should be a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people talking now. Jimmy Rogers was out. I saw an interview with him. This is going to be worse than the, uh, the 08 crisis. Alan Greenspan, again, is out there talking about why this potentially could be worse. And what's worse is, I mean, in fact, some of these banks may uh, be in a position where they have to raise equity, which means they have to sell stock. And clearly, the market is not going to like that. But again, you know, everybody is really blaming this on all the uncertainty surrounding Brexit. And I hear all these stories about how so many companies are going to be affected uh, by this. And, you know, to me, the whole thing really seems like a bunch of nonsense. If we had a healthy financial system, if the markets were sound and prices were based on fundamentals, would it really make that much of a difference if the UK were in the EU or not? I mean, what do they got, 28 members of the EU? I mean, so if it's got 27 members, is that really a big deal? I mean, how many countries are not part of the EU? I mean, so if Britain 